You have the ability in this brief window of time to take massive risks in your life. I was like, if this is true, why did nobody ever teach me this? You have all this amazing freedom to try things and fail and get back up quickly and it's okay. You can't do 10 things at 10% and expect to get results. There he is. How you doing, Cody? What's going on, Evan? How are you? Amazing. Thank you for making the time, man. It's it's great having you here. Well, thanks, man. Make sure you're uh, you're ready for this because I'm gonna bring the heat. I, I don't want you to crash now. Oh, we need heat because there's <laughs> snow here. We're 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 in the middle of uh, New Mexico and there's snow on the ground, so we need we need the Cody fire. All right, I'll bring it. I promise you, I'll bring it. Cool, man. Listen, it's it's been it's been fun uh, learning about you, diving into your world a little bit. But for my audience, Instagram, YouTube, give us a quick like one minute. Who is Cody? Who is Cody Spermer? Um, that's always a funny question. When, when when I get asked that question from like people, like if my wife puts me up on like a mandate or something, you know, with like one of her friends' husbands, uh, it's always such an odd question because it's so complicated sometimes when you're an entrepreneur to like narrow that down into just a few simple things that make people like get it um yep. so let, let me break it into a couple segments first off cody sperber the father cody sperber is a husband i've been with my wife for uh, 14 years a little over 14 years now and she's put up with me the entire time which is like <laughs> unbelievable because you know as an entrepreneur you're like the least enjoyable person as you're trying to get a business up off the ground to to be around 24 sevens, especially when you're obsessed with what you do. Um, so she's, it's been amazing uh, being able to figure out how to make that work. I'd love to talk about that. I have two amazing kids. My son's name is Hudson. He is literally mini me. And okay. my daughter, he's nine years old. And my daughter is Brinley. And she's literally mini my wife. And so we're, on, on the surface, we're this picture-perfect family. Uh, I'll get into why that's not necessarily true, you know, once you get a little deeper. Uh, but they're my why. My family is my biggest driver. When, when I first started as an entrepreneur, I, I was just in it for the money. And as soon as I had kids, every, it's like God punched me in the head and said, this is, this is, this is, there's something bigger in life huh. than, than just making money. And so uh, that's on the personal side. Um, I, I love snowboarding. I, I, you know, my favorite place to go is Cabo. You know, I love to travel uh, and I'm obsessed with uh, what I do for a living. And to transition over there, my real estate business started 14 years ago. I started with no money, had no clue that creative real estate investing even existed. Uh, and I'll talk about maybe how I got into that. And then uh, uh, 14 years, I flipped over a thousand houses got really stinking good at what I do. And uh, in 2010, uh, so many people were coming to me. I was killing it here in Arizona. And if you go back to 06, when the market melted down, I rode all the way up, I rode all the way down, and I took advantage of every opportunity the whole way. And I earned the nickname, the clever investor. That's kind of where that, just doing really creative marketing things, really being aggressive with how I got deals and then wrote it all the way back up now. And so I've uh, been fortunate enough to partner with all kinds of amazing people. I've done business with Barbara Corcoran, Josh Altman from Million Dollar Listing, Ken and Anita Corsini from HGTV's Flipper Flop Atlanta, uh, Doug Hopkins from Property Wars, like all the big shows. Um, a lot of people were coming to me trying to figure out how I was doing what I was doing on the investing side. Mm -hmm. And that's where the education business was born. In 2010, I launched Clever Investor, the education company, no clue what I was doing. Once again, you know, I thought I know real estate. I'm really good at real estate. It, I, it should be easy to teach it. And uh, over the last eight plus years, I've been building this education company. It's the most challenging thing I've ever done. Uh, most rewarding thing I've ever done. And uh, we could talk a little bit about some of the lessons that I learned along the way there. Uh, but I scaled that business. I still, I, I still flip houses with my two best friends. I got 12 rehabs going right now. Uh, we're three old guys flipping houses. It's kind of fun. And uh, uh, yeah, so I'm balancing a lot of different things. I've, 
taken a lot of the money that I've made and I've invested it into assets. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about why that's important. And uh, uh, I, I own a lot of different businesses now. I own a wine storage facility. And now I have all these streams of income, all this complication, and somehow I've still figured out how to make my family the central hub of every single thing that I do. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk about why balance is the hardest thing in the world, I think, for an entrepreneur to figure out how to, how to work with, because I, I don't believe balance exists. Right, so what, so do you, what do you call it? If it's not balance, what do you call it? Compartmentalizing. Okay. I, I think it's compartmentalizing, and I think it's learning, you know, that book, learning about love languages. I yep. think it's really important to understand any relationship that you have, kind of what their big love language is, and lean in on that. I've, I've gotten pretty good at uh, figuring out when that moment is when I come home that I, I need to shut off the office. I need to shut off my real estate educator or the real estate investor, Cody, and just be the dad, just be the husband, just be there and be present. Um, my wife's love language isn't gifts. You know, she doesn't care about money. She's not a money driven person. She cares about me being present there with mm. the kids. And she cares about the little things, me listening, me being, you know, uh, t making them a priority. And like now I've, I've gotten to a point where I can actually uh, take as much time off as I want and travel the world with them and do all these amazing fun things. And I've gotten pretty good at shutting the business off when I do those things. Um, I was only be able to do that because I built a great team. Have you, have you come up with any rules that you guys try to live by, uh, whether it's shut off work at a certain amount of time or especially in real estate, it's, it's hard. Like what are the, what are the rules that you develop for yourself that allow you to continue to live that life? Um, I don't, can I just be, can I just be yeah, honest? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 let's super go, off. yeah. All right, um, when I first got with Shannon, and I, this is kind of, Kevin says Cody's wife is hot, that's funny. She is hot, I married way, way, way up. When I first got with Shannon, um, I, I actually sat her down at one point, and I, I, I had the talk. The talk was, I love you. You're I like, I want to have a life with you. I'm definitely marrying way up, but I have these hopes and dreams over here that I, I don't know why I'm obsessed with them. I don't know what's pulling me in this direction, but I feel like I won't live my life's purpose if I don't chase these ambitions and these mm -hmm. dreams and these goals. And if you can't be okay with that, if you can't be that person that is tough enough to be with the entrepreneur then I don't think we're going to work. I honestly don't think we're going to work. And uh, so I had the upfront conversation with her in the beginning and she bought into it and she fully understood at the time what she thought that meant. But she, I think she also <laughs> thought at some point that I would let become the barbecued soccer coaching dad and I just chill, you know, and I think she always had this hope that and I kept selling her the dream that, hey, next year is going to be better. Next year, my business will be at a place where I can chill and all this stuff. For the first eight years, it was not like that. I, mm. we, um, we probably almost split up five times, ten times per year oh, wow. for eight years. Like, and then having children, that really complicated things. You know, mo a lot of marriages fail just because of finances or just because of not being in alignment with your goals or your ambitions, not being an, a good communicator. I was – all of those things, you know, I was right. a horrible communicator. I was obsessed with getting my business off the ground. I was barely present when I was home. I did not know how to shut it off. We had a child. My son Hudson came into our, our lives and it felt like a bomb went off in our life. Everybody's like, when, you know, when, when I had my kid, it was like love at first sight. I didn't feel that way at all. When I had my kid, I thought he looked like a space alien and I thought my, wor <laughs> my world just imploded. You know, I was like... <laughs> how am I going to make this work? You know, I felt so much stress and pressure and I just wasn't good hmm. at ba f figuring that out. I, I thought I had to live by society's rules that you have, you know, you're supposed to be married and you're supposed to be happy and you're supposed to have a family and all these things. And that didn't really jive with my ambitions and my goals to build this empire. 
and it was really difficult. Thank God she stuck with me through it. So the rules that I have, to get back to your question, where yeah. it finally turned the corner for me is when I realized that I was doing such a poor job as a husband and as a father, and that I was going to lose my family pretty much, that it happened to me in the garage one day. I pulled my car in, and a lot of times when, when you're an entrepreneur, you carry all this toxic weight of everybody around you, right? Because you're always yep. trying to, you're, you're a problem solver. That's what entrepreneurship is. You're, you're a big problem solver. And so people get used to bringing you the challenges and the things and, and you fix them and then you keep it moving forward. And so for me, I would bring that home. And so when I walked in the house normally and my wife said, how was your day? I was like, oh, this deal was falling apart and this real estate agent went sideways on me and the lender is a pain in my ass and all this stuff, right? And I just unload blah, this toxic right. stuff. No, I love you. No, the, 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 the cooking smells amazing. No, how was your day? How were, you know, tell me about you. Tell me about your, your life and what's going on with you. It's all about me and all the, that I was dealing with. And she put up with that for a long period of time. But what would happen is she would explode because she can only put up with so much. So much, yeah. And then, and then it just came out, and, it, and I got shocked by it because I would look at her and go, like, what's the deal? Why are you so making that little thing into such a big thing? What I was failing to understand, it was all these little things building up and this lack of love and me not understanding her love language and me not making them a priority. So one day I was sitting in the garage, and I, don't, I knew it, we were on the brinking point. And I just made a decision that I was going to park my business in the garage. And as soon as I walked in the house, I was going to shift to not entrepreneur Cody, not businessman Cody, not real estate investor Cody. I was going to be the best father I could be Cody and the best husband I could be Cody. And that means the cell phone has to go away. That means no checking social media. That means none of that stuff. And I sat there in the garage for about 10 minutes that first day. And I went through all of my, my life at business. And then I, I made a mental a vision, a, a mental vision of me parking that in the car. And when I walked in, I rolled my shoulders back and put a smile on my face. I left all that in the garage. And mm. that, that was kind of a turning point for me. And my wife didn't really recognize it the first couple times I did it. But over the weeks, I developed a new habit. And that new habit really helped us start getting back on a better communication path. And one day she finally was like, what gives? Why, how are you like, you're like a different person when you're at home now. And I'm like, I'm just, it's like all things that you focus on. The energy flows where your focus goes. And I'm focused on loving more. Mm. I'm focused on our relationship more. And I'm, I've been in relationship for you for eight years. And it's time for that to, it's me, not you. And that was it. And that was the turning point to it. I'm not saying we're perfect and I still screw up and I, I'm kind of, you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm a hot mess a lot of times. You know, people and, see my, my Instagram wall and they're like, dude, your life is the bomb. And I'm like, you have no idea what a show I am. 90% of the day. It's interesting. Like, is part of your, your mission ongoing to try to rub some of the shine off? I think my magic with a lot of people and for those of you that don't know me that are, that first of all, thank you for having me on here. I didn't even, say, I didn't even say that. Um, uh, my relatability has always been some of my magic and yeah. self efficacy is a really important thing in marketing. And it's a really important thing in business and why people like me, cause there's a lot of places you can go to learn real estate, YouTube university. There's tons of blogs and forums and, gurus and podcasts, people lean in on me because I do a couple of things. One, I make them feel like they can do this. So when they hear my, me talk or they see my success and they know that I was, I didn't come from money. I've, I've screwed everything up. I've, I've made a lot of bad choices in life. I grew up in a tough environment. You know, my, my family is a hot mess. Like most families, I have uncles, crazy uncles and uh, we didn't come from money and, uh, I sold drugs as a kid. You know, I, I sold candy out of a backpack when I was a little kid and that graduated to selling weed. And, you know, nobody thought of me as the guy that would just, you know, skateboard around and sell dime bags. But back then I was, I was always looking to get money cause we were so poor. 
And if I wanted anything and I went to ask my dad for anything, my dad would always say, what am I made of money? Or money doesn't go on trees around here. You got to figure out a way to get, get the bike or get the skateboard or get whatever you want. And so I did. And I was not supervised. My dad was a very hard worker and he was gone a lot. And my mom was a stay at home mom, but I didn't have a lot of rules growing up. And I was one of the only white kids in my neighborhood. I, uh, most of my friends were Hispanic and I grew up in a kind of a rougher area of Mesa, Arizona. And, uh, so I had a lot of freedom to get into trouble. And, uh, so I chose to hang around the wrong people. And just to fast forward for a lot of people watching, uh, I would have gone down a path. And probably ended up like a lot of my friends at the time. A lot of my friends went to juvenile hall. A lot of my friends ended mm -hmm. up in prison. The only reason I didn't is because when I was growing up, my dad, who is my best friend, my idol, my mentor, right? I didn't have successful people around me. My dad was the most successful person I knew. I didn't know we didn't have money. You know, when you're a kid, you don't know how poor you are. I lived in apartments and I lived in rental houses. And I didn't know any different. I thought it was great. You know, I had a great childhood and I love my parents. I wouldn't change anything. Um, but uh, my, I was originally going to live my dad's dreams. My dad wanted me to go to college because no Sperber had ever graduated college before. And so he was pushing, go to college, go to college. But I'm a D student. You know, I'm not, I, I have ADHD. I can't pay attention for very long. If I'm into something, I'm obsessed and everything else is I totally neglect. And so I struggle. I didn't have any good, successful mentors in my life. I never had anybody sit me down and talk to me about money or making money or money management or financial literacy or financial intelligence. It was all just hustling and winging it. And my dad wanted me to go to college. And I tried. I, after high school, I went and I applied for community college because I couldn't qualify to go to real college. And I lasted one week before I dropped out. And the mm. best thing that ever happened to me is my dad circled back around and he put pressure on me. He said, if you're not going to go to college, you either got to get a job or you need to go in the military. And I elected to go into the Navy, mm. which was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. I hated it at the time. I didn't realize how, what a, do you believe that there are pivot points in your life? A hundred percent. Those little special yeah, yeah. moments. Yeah. The Navy, Navy was one of my first major pivot points. Mm. It forced me to get away from my friends. It mm. forced me to separate from that environment of addictions and abuse. And, you know, m my uncles all went to jail. One of them got addicted to heroin. They all came out of the Vietnam War. Um, you know, nobody in, in my house was educated on any high level. My dad was uh, getting fired from his job every two years. And so we moved around a lot. And so I just was on, I was constant turmoil as a kid and uh, separating from that environment, being put in a structure, even though I hated the, the feeling of people controlling me and, and forcing me to do things, best thing that ever happened to me because I quit doing drugs. I quit hanging around bozos. I manned up, I traveled the world. And when you're in Pakistan and you see the way some of these people live, and then you come back to the USA, you're like, what the frick am I complaining about? Mm. You know, it's like, what, who am I to whine about prices or who am I to whine about opportunities? You know, go over there and, you know, women, this is all you see is their eyeballs, you know? And it's like, wow, what an oppressed economy what an oppressed regime i'm so grateful to have this opportunity so the navy gave me that perspective <clears throat> what do you I... recommend for someone who is feeling like they relate to your story they grew up with people who might be in, in prison right now or just people who are negative and not reaching for their dreams and the you know we don't have enough money and it's not our fault you know waiting for the government to come and save you just excuses and negativity uh, what would you tell them to go off and do? Like the Navy changed your life. What, what would you recommend somebody to step out of that shell and discover themselves? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. I really think that's a really big question. And there's a lot of personal stuff in that that would need to be analyzed. But 
Today, it's a little bit different. You got to go back 20 something years ago when I was 18, there was no YouTube, there's no social media, there was no cell phone with access to infinite knowledge and opportunities. There was no access to a mentor like you. Like I go to your YouTube channel and I'm like, mentor, instant mentors, right? Like right. live mentors, dead mentors. Like I learned from all these greats just by hanging out on your YouTube channel. That didn't exist. So I think my answer then would, if I was to pull myself into today's world would probably be different because I think if you can find somebody like an Evan or a Cody or whatever industry you're into that can mentor you through the process and you're willing to take the risk, like the best advice I would give somebody young right now is take risks. Mm -hmm. You have the ability in this brief window of time to take massive risks in your life. I have two kids. I have a $3 million house, a big mortgage. I have debt. I have pressures and stress. I have big businesses. I have all this stuff. And in the beginning, you have all this freedom. You don't realize it at the time, but you have all this amazing freedom to try things and fail and get back up quickly. And it's okay. Like you can, you can live with your parents again. You can move in with a friend. You can sacrifice. As you get older, it gets harder. So um, I just think it's going to be a little different for everybody. But for me, the military was just a pivot point when I was coming out of it, I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. It's not like I had this epiphany like, oh, I'm going to go be this super successful person. Nobody right. would have thought or counted me as a success story in the future. Nobody was lifting me up on their shoulders saying, this is the guy. There was no gold star or accolades. I wasn't class valedictorian. I was the opposite of that. I was counted out. I felt insignificant. I was pushed around. I was not a cool kid. I, I, I never fit into the cool kid club. Mm. And I found that that was looking back now, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I used that anger and that frustration and that drive of feeling of like my back's against the wall. I have to make some magic happen. I, I can't live like this. I drew a line in the sand like, this is it, dude. You're either going to accept the fact that this is how everybody treats you and labels you and you're going to buy into that BS or you're going to do something about it. And I chose and a lot of people do choose to do something about it when you get that much pressure boiling up. And so the, the military just was that man up moment in my life. Mm. But what, what before I went in the military, my life's goal was to be a history teacher. Right. That was it. Okay. Like I, and only because there's only two teachers. If, and I bet you if you're watching this and you think back, how many teachers do you remember their names? Oh, yeah. Very few. Very few. And it's not because they taught you math or science. Right. Like they had an impact on you. Mr. Safransky, second grade and my ninth grade history teacher were the only two teachers in my whole evolution in formal education that ever made an impact on me. And I always thought wow, that'd be kind of cool to be able to do, give, make an impact on some other kid coming up. So I wanted to be a ninth grade history teacher. And when I was coming out of the military, my dad came back around and was like, what are you going to do with your life? And I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm going to be a history teacher. And he said, well, go talk to a history professor. And when I talked to the, I went to the community college and I talked to the history professor and I said, hey, I got this MGI bill. I can come back to school now and actually afford it. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what do you make? And the guy was like, maybe $50,000 a year on a good year. And I'm like, there is zero possibility I'm going to live the life that I want on $50,000 a year. And it's so sad that we don't pay our teachers more, especially, and I was thinking ninth grade history, I'm probably going to make like 40 or 30. Not, I, was, I wasn't even trying to be a professor. And so I was really struggling with what I wanted to do with my life. And of course, what do I do? I go back to my dad and I say, dad. They only make $50,000 a year. What do I do? And he said, well, I wish that I would have learned the language of business because I'm not very good at business. And I wish I would have learned the language of business. Why don't you go for finance and accounting? And I'm like, are you insane? I'm the worst person at math. I, I got D's in math. I cheated on every math test. Like, I am not a finance guy. Like, are you crazy? Like, I can't balance a checkbook. I don't know anything about money. In fact, my whole life, I modeled you. 
which you're a hoarder. You know, you never do anything with money. Like, you don't, you don't invest. Like, what do you mean finance? And he's like, just trust me on this. It's the best thing that you could do. So once again, living my dad's dream, I go and I apply for a, to go to school for finance. And I get accepted because I was prior military. And the best, the second pivot point in my life happened. While I was going to college, I was only in college for a couple months. And I got invited to go to lunch with a friend named Jeremy, who... Uh, I used to party with, he was just a normal dude and he shows up in a brand new Mercedes. And I'm like, dude, what gives? Where'd you get the Mercedes? And he's like, oh my God, I flipped a house and I made $80,000. And I'm thinking to myself, you flipped a house? How did you do that? You don't have any money. Like, and people can't flip houses without money. And he's like, oh no, let me show you something. And he literally got out a napkin. And he penciled out creative, uh, a creative investing strategy called wholesaling. Now, at the time, I never heard of wholesaling. I didn't know anything about real estate. I just thought real estate was for rich people. I thought real estate investing was ex you know, expensive and complicated. Like when I think about real estate, I think it's hard. A lot of moving pieces. I don't know anything about contracts or legal or uh, marketing or how to structure a real estate deal. I don't know anything about construction. How could I ever do real estate? And so I just always pass it off as something other people did later on in life when you had a bunch of money. And here Jeremy is penciling it out on a napkin saying, no, this is what I did. I, I found a house and it, I negotiated and I put it under contract and I flipped the contract to an investor and I made $80,000 and I didn't have any money into the deal. And He's telling me all this stuff, and I'm like, no money. You didn't use your credit. You were able to do it in under 30 days, and you made all this money. This is some bullshit. Like, this is a scam. Like, who'd you scam? That was my thought. Who did you scam? And he's like, I'm telling you, people are doing this all over. So I took the napkin, and I left that meeting pissed off. And I was pissed off because I was like, if this is true, why did nobody ever teach me this? Mm. How come I didn't know this world existed? What else don't I know? Like, so, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you're analyzing your world. And I'm like, what if this is true? Maybe I should look at it a little further. So after a couple of weeks of sitting on that app, and I finally was like, you know what? I'm going to look at it. So I called back Jeremy. I'm like, is this real, man? He's like, I'm telling you, it's real. Go to this seminar. And there's these people that have like infomercial gurus and they, they do these seminars and these workshops and you can learn this process. So of course, I'm like everybody pre YouTube, I go to seminars and they love me because as soon as I got excited about the real estate concept and I started realizing that this was actually a real thing and a lot of people were doing this all over the country, I pulled out my credit card. I was like, let's go. I was swiping and buying course after course after course. Every time I walked into a seminar, I walked out with bags of books and tapes and CDs. And I hated formal education, but I loved self-education. Like I just, I devoured that information. The challenge is I went to this seminar and the next month I went to that seminar and then I went and learned from this guru and I did over here. Next thing I know, I got 50 courses all laid out on a table and I felt so overwhelmed, more confused than ever. I had no clue where to begin. It felt like a giant jigsaw puzzle that was all jumbled up. And now I'm excited and confused and I'm trying all these little things and I'm a complete hot mess. No traction, no results. The first month leads into the second month, leads into the sixth month. And all of a sudden my youthful enthusiasm, because I was so excited about this, is like, Tra trailing off and my dad who's been my hero my whole life is sitting me down saying this is the dumbest idea you're wasting a bunch of time stop going after real estate is not a career right being an investor is not a career you're going to make a mistake wait until you have money and then you can come back around and invest once you have money get just finish college get good grades get a good job work your way up the corporate ladder he was telling me the typical thing and um, after a few months of getting everybody's opinion, everybody telling me, try this, don't do this, that doesn't work, this works, 
my dad telling me it sucks. It's not, it's a bad idea. My, all my friends making fun of me. Around that seventh, eighth month, all my self-limiting beliefs are just like boiling up now. Now I'm a complete disaster. I've invested about $25,000 into my education on credit cards. I have no way to pay the credit cards. I'm freaking out. I'm running out of steam. Every little thing that happens, I'm exploding over. My, I, my attitude was horrible. It was just a derailment. And at the ninth month, I quit. And I was like, screw it. I can't do it. My, my girlfriend, who's my wife, was like so supportive in the beginning. By the ninth month, she's like, go get a job, dude. You got to pay these credit card bills. This is insane. You're not going to be a real estate investor. Just let it go. And so I went and I got a job as a bookkeeper. And the only reason I got a job as a bookkeeper is because I was going to school for finance. And the only job I could find was doing books for this real estate developer. So I thought, okay, I'm kind of still staying in the industry. And I lied on my resume and told him I knew how to do books. I've never done books in my life. I had no idea what books were. I hadn't even taken those classes yet. And I, I tell him I know how to do books. So I went to the bookstore. I got a book, Accounting for Dummies, or Bookkeeping for Dummies. And I read it all night long, and I went to work the next day. And I'm now a bookkeeper. And to fast forward this story, I actually taught myself how to do books over the next two months. This guy that I'm working for is a complete asshole. He's rude to everybody. He's de degrading, but he's making an embarrassing amount of money. And I'm, I'm the bookkeeper. So I see the money coming in, the money going out, money coming in, money going out. So I'm like, holy smokes, this guy's killing it. I'm making $34,000 a year. I hate my job. Like, I hate it. Like, I love, if you're a bookkeeper and you're watching this, God bless you. We need them. It's a great, I don't, I'm not bashing the, 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 uh, the job, but I personally felt like I was in prison every day sitting at a cubicle, every day waiting in traffic, every day just getting yelled at while this guy is out there just murdering it. And around the three or four month mark, I was complaining all the time. I would, I would, I was the worst employee ever. I would make excuses. I was late. I was a victim. I would blame everybody. I would find reasons to take long lunch breaks, then make excuses as to why I wasn't there. I hated my job. And, a re and this is my next pivot point. All right. So uh, is this, is this also, I know we're like 10 minutes over what we were supposed to do. And I super appreciate the extra time. Like, can we find this story somewhere? Is this, is this all part of your training? Like this is the first time I've told it all the way through like that. This, but, this is a yeah, great, a, I mean, I'm honored. This is a great YouTube video, but like that needs to be told. It's amazing. Yeah. And we, and we, and I can cut it short. I know I, I get going and I, I get excited about it because it's, it's these pivot points that people need to feel in order to realize that it's not always a straight line. You know, sometimes you've got to take a massive step back. And that's really the lesson that I wanted to, to share is you have this vision of what you want to accomplish. And I thought that I was going to be able to get there in a straight line, but I wasn't. I, I kept taking these massive steps back, not realizing that these pivot points were going to happen and reshift me back on track. Um, so, yes, my clever uh, at Clever Investor is my YouTube channel. And so they can find videos over there. Um, but just to, to I'll, three sentences and I'll cut it short. Um, my, uh, when I was at that place where I'm now working for somebody else, I quit on my dreams. I had a friend come into my life named Zach who basically said, hey, Sperber, I know you're not living your life's purpose. I know you're not unhappy. I talked to your girlfriend. She, she thinks you're miserable. I think you're miserable. I'm going to a seminar. And I know you hate these things now. And I know you've been burned in the past. And I know you've had a lot of gurus take advantage of you and you, you haven't done a deal, but this is different. This is a group of people. That's a real community. This is something that's magical. And I really think you're going to get a lot out of this. So reluctantly, I went with him to that seminar and it was an old timer named Jack Miller. Jack Miller has recently passed away. But when I walked into that room, I knew instantaneously that that group was different. It was different than everything else I've ever been a part of. The love, the energy, the compassion, the support, everything was in that room. 
and they were real deal makers doing real, real stuff. It, what, they weren't trying to shove products and courses down your throat. They were just trying to do deals and, and share their passion of real estate. That's where I found my first mentor. That was the pivot point of my whole career. I could still be that pissed off bookkeeper or worse. I could be that guy that wastes all his time trying to figure out what he wants to do in life and try to figure out how to make it work and always kind of hustling, but never quite getting there. But when Lyle came into my life, it, it was like I finally was able to cut through all that BS. It was almost like my life had been Swiss cheese up to that point with all these little holes and missing pieces. And he just pulled it all together and filled it in. And he taught me a couple very important things. And the first and foremost is you can't do 10 things at 10% and expect to get results. Focus. You're doing too much. Focus. I love it. In, and it's intention. Cody, your intention is good, but it's your energy is focused on the wrong things. You need to focus on one, maybe two big hairy goals. That is it. And your enthusiasm, your energy levels, everything needs to get super hyper focused on the dominating those one or two things. So I'm a clever investor on almost every platform. On Instagram, I'm very yeah. active. I have over 1.2 million followers on uh, YouTube. YouTube, I just started about three months ago. So that's where I really want people to go and engage with me is over on YouTube. So uh, it's at Clever Investor or search for Cody Sperber on YouTube. You'll see me over there. I'm posting three videos a day. Uh, I do focus mainly on real estate investing, but I talk about marketing, entrepreneurship, life, struggle. I share the good, the bad, the ugly. And, I love uh, it, dude. And for yeah. my YouTube audience, we'll put that in the description below so you can go check out Cody. I appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much. And uh, appreciate all the love and looking forward to diving deeper into your world. If you want more motivation, check out my interview with Elliot Hulse. The link is right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Don't be lazy. It's important for a man to have boundaries. I came here to deliver my consciousness to the planet.